and I'm Alain Stellion, the Midlife Empowerment Coach, and today I'm thrilled to introduce Mershon Neisner. Mershon has a background as a certified life coach, social worker, marketing entrepreneur, freelance writer, and author. Having lost her mother at age eight, Mershon's mission is to help other women who have experienced loss move forward in a healthy way. She's doing this by speaking to groups, posting regularly to a mother loss blog, and publishing a book. Between them, Mershon and her husband, Ken, have six children, 19 grandchildren, wow, and eight great-grands. Wow, that is amazing. Mershon, welcome. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. And to start out, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what motivates you, uh, you know, how did you actually get started uh, working on this, uh, you know, with women who have experienced loss and mother loss very specifically? How has it become your mission? Thank you. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. I love being here. I love being in conversation. Uh, so this is, this is really a treat. And, um, and also your, your question to your audience is where in the world are you? I just want to let people know I'm on beautiful Marco Island, Florida. Um, <clears throat> but I, next month I'll soon be going back to see my, all those greats and grands in Illinois. <laughs> so that's where I'll be. Um, but to answer your question, how did I get started on all this? Um, obviously I've had a, a a lifetime of uh, mother loss, and I'm the motherless daughter of a motherless daughter. So uh, both my mother and I, or my mother and and I lost our mothers in our 30s. So I have a history of mother loss, um, <clears throat> but I really had never considered writing a book or doing anything about that. It wasn't a, a mission in any way until really just recently, probably uh, less than five years ago. I just uh, randomly ran into a woman who was real active in the Marco Island Writers Group and she challenged me to write a book and she invited me to join the group, et cetera. And, it was it just a light bulb went off and I just knew that it needed to be about mother loss. And I wanted to, um, you know, just make a difference for other daughters. Yeah. So what led you to actually write this uh, a book? Like, did you did you right away know, you know what, this is there's really this potential for a book here, I need to write all of this down. I mean, you've interviewed a lot of women. So how did all that come about? Well, I started with, uh, with just kind of writing my own story, which is an early loss story, obviously. So I started there and then really it was very organic. Um, women just kind of appeared in my life, you know, that would say, oh, I would talk about how I was, you know, thinking about writing this book and they'd say, oh, well, I lost my mother, um, you know, to you know, Alzheimer's, or I lost my mother uh, at, an, at a later age. And so that kind of got it started. And then also, I had been in um, groups, therapy groups, two of them that were led by a professional therapist, and they were for women who had experienced early loss. And that woman, <clears throat> the therapist, she uh, sent an email to her past clients and said, if you're interested in participating in this project, let Mershon know. So I, uh, that was a good start. So I had several people to interview there, but the rest, you know, it was a very organic thing. And then as I wanted to flesh out certain areas, uh, for instance, those who had uh, lost through Alzheimer's or whatever, then I started appealing to people in uh, groups like Facebook, mm -hmm. et cetera. There are many, many mother lost Facebook groups. <clears throat> so I started appealing to them and I, I found some others, but I interviewed over 50 women uh, all together with a whole, and it was all phone interviews. A couple uh, were done in person, but mostly phone interviews. And some just felt like they couldn't talk about it, literally. And they would send, um, they would answer my questions and send everything to me via email. So if you did wow. that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because, uh, you know, that it, how did you choose the types of mother loss to focus on mm -hmm. 
like you, you focus on women who have lost mothers young, women who have lost, uh, who have lost um, or, you know, or teen or young adult, and then through a, abandonment, homicide, and Alzheimer's. Like those seem specific. Were those particularly just happened to be the women you found or? They, well, mostly they just showed up. Like the one who had not lost her mother physically, her mother did not die. Well, she's died since, but her mother did not die, but she was completely emotionally not present her whole mm. life. Um, and so she, and she's a friend and she came to me. In fact, she used to be a coaching client and she came to me and said, well, I didn't lose my mother, but I want to tell my story because it really impacted my life. And so she did, you know, and I think yeah. it's an important story to a lot of women who have had an experience like that. Uh, I have two stories of uh, daughters who lost their mothers through homicide. It was in both cases, their um, stepfathers. Um, so, you know, that was something I'd never really considered even. Uh, but one thing, one thing that I did learn that overall it seemed to me, and this was a surprise, it seemed to me that daughters who lost their mothers as young adults, like in their early 20s around mm. in there, they have had the, the hardest time in many cases. Now, of course, young daughters who, who had very bad caregivers, you know, that's a real horrific scenario. But, yeah. um, but everything being even, it was those, those uh, younger uh, adult women. And I think it's because they were past the push pull of being teenagers. Mm -hmm. And they had just started really having a friendship with their mothers. It was a whole different relationship than yeah. they'd ever had. And so that loss was particularly difficult. So that was one of the things that I had met, you know, had not occurred to me. Yeah, that's so interesting that and that makes a lot of sense that just as they're kind of coming together and maybe looking at their mother in a different way, maybe, you know, past the conflict uh, part of their relationship, they, then uh, they lose their mother. I mean, that's, uh, yeah, that's tragic. Um, so it's interesting then when you're talking about loss, that loss can mean a lot of different things. It doesn't have to mean physical loss. It can be, mean also a loss of, you know, you, you may have the physical presence, but the person was never emotionally available to you. Or the, in the case of Alzheimer's, your mother, leaves you mentally she's not able to you know even maybe recognize you toward the end or something so there's so loss is really not doesn't just mean death in this case right exactly exactly and and the alzheimer's that was also just a whole new arena for me that i didn't know a lot about had not had a lot of personal experience and so um and that's a twice lost you know they they lose them uh, first, like you say, when they're, they don't no longer recognize them, et cetera, and then they lose them again to death. So that is a really tough time. And one of the uh, really critical stories in my book uh, is about um, early onset Alzheimer's loss. And <clears throat> the woman who had the Alzheimer's, she was in her 40s when she was diagnosed, and her daughters were only 11 and 13, I believe. And, um, but she, but the person who was experiencing the early loss Alzheimer's wrote uh, about her feelings and experience while she still could. And I have that in my book. And then I, uh, that was the young daughter who really found using her creativity helped her get through this time. And so I have some poems, um, by her in the book is also but that um that's a really tough thing you know to yeah. be a, a teenager and you know her mother was at home for several years as yeah. she declined so that again was a whole sort of new experience for me to to learn about that you know I mean, that's really young with Alzheimer's. I, you know, I think of Alzheimer's as, you know, somebody my age might lose their parent to, to Alzheimer's when you're in midlife, but losing them when you're so young to early onset, I mean, that's got to be uh, 
really difficult and because it's it's hard enough at our age to see our parent decline you know and it, but we have some understanding of the process the disease the whatever but when you're that young and your parent doesn't seem like themselves anymore that's got to be feel very foreign and and scary yeah it's very difficult very difficult yeah yeah and you chose to focus on daughters right you don't not the not sons right is so what is it about that mother daughter relationship that you really wanted to sort of illuminate there well first of all it's what i know you know so i mean i know about mother loss my father uh lived to be 92 <clears throat> so i had him for a long time i talk a lot about him in my book because he was a great dad he was a great dad and that was one of the huge benefits that I mm. had as a daughter of loss that I, you know, was oblivious to for many years. Really, I was oblivious to how significant his role was in my life until I got into groups of other motherless daughters who had yeah. lost their mothers young and, liter and literally they were angry with me. I mean, they were, I mean, they were so wow. jealous actually yeah. that I had had this experience of a really great dad. And I had no one else in my life. I was an only child. Okay. We had no relatives nearby. So it was my dad and I, and we really partnered up kind of against the world. I mean, yeah. Girls were not raised alone by fathers in the 50s, right. let me tell right. you. So people were kind of, you know, hanging out the windows waiting, waiting for us to fail. And we were very determined to have a, a joy-filled life, and we did. Wow. So yeah. what was it about your dad that, I mean, he sounds amazing. What was it about him that allowed him to take on that role so willingly and and successfully because yeah, I would imagine, and I don't know if he remarried or, or repartnered, but I would imagine it would be, you know, in those days, kind of the, the impetus would be go find somebody else and then they can raise you. Yeah, he was only 36, um, but he didn't remarry until I went to college, um, which, you know, I think was fortunate for me, frankly, um, maybe not so much for him, but he was very focused on being a dad and he he turned down promotions so that he could we could live in one place and not have to move around i grew up in the same house um he worked for the veterans administration and so he basically left the same time came home the same time right. i had a very very stable life yeah. and um <clears throat> so that that was a lot of it and i didn't even think about it frankly or realize until right much, much later. I mean, really, it was only in his later years, like maybe his 80s, that he that he told me how scared he was. He's like, yeah. I was scared to death. Yeah. You know, and he had been gone much of my early life because he was first in World War II. And he was gone right after I was born. He was away most of that first year. Then, you know, after he got out of, um, the military, then we bought a house, we were kind of back together as a family, and then he got recalled for the Korean War and he was gone again. So we hardly knew each other, really. Um, so, you know, that was a whole nother interesting dynamic. Yeah, I bet. And it, it sounds like, um, you know, despite having all that stability and that wonderful opportunity with your dad, you still need, had some feelings to process about. So, does, you know, despite all that, you know, good um, uh, outcome for you, uh, it sounds like there's still a lot that women who've lost their mothers, maybe especially young or in difficult circumstances, have to process. And so how did you go about uh, doing that work? And, and is there something you learned that you can impart to other women who are still have residual feelings, difficult feelings around losing their mothers? Well, I didn't know that I had work to do <laughs> until I was 45. Oh, interesting. Um, I just went along, lived my life. I mean, I, I certainly had, uh, I had uh, issues around abandonment. I had, you know, um, some other 
uh, some other kinds of things. But I didn't really recognize it as being a part of my mother loss experience. You know, I just went on my merry way. And then at 45, I was in the midst of a divorce and I, I started going to therapy and that and you know it was all about the divorce and then she's like hmm, I think you need to do some work on mother loss I'm like mother loss that was a long time right. and that's when I did really a lot of the work that led to my understanding and led to this book and in fact um there's several things that I did as a part of that therapy that I include in this book that were really important. And then she also led me into these short term, they were only eight weeks, these short term uh, motherless daughters groups as well. So that was, you know, it was a long time later that, but you know, I mean, in today's world, if I was you know, eight years old today and lost my mother, it would be very different, I probably, would have gone to the counseling or therapy or something but but we're talking the 1950s right. you know there were, that was just not even available really yeah. i don't even i hadn't even um you know it wasn't there on no one's radar particularly right. at that time so um you know that's and and i didn't show any symptoms you know i'm sure right. my dad would have found some kind of help for me had i had right you know, outward sort of symptoms that were holding me back. But I, you know, I was um, doing really well, thriving. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's just, it's interesting that there, I did, you know, wouldn't have conceived of it, but there are groups for everything, right? So it sounds like there's a good network for women who are, um, you know, suffering. Uh, I wonder if you have any advice for women who have lost their mothers, either through early age or later and sort of how, you know, what, what helps with healing from that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think if you are having really some serious um, trauma, then I always say get help. You know, I mean, even if I didn't have it as a young child, the help that I got later in my life was tremendously uh, good for me. And many of the people I interviewed also sought help. So there's that. And then, um, and then some of the other things I talk about, first of all, here she is, she's showing up, she has a question, good for you, because telling your story, um, you know, not hiding all this under uh, a barrel somewhere is also a step. Um, I think also as you as you reach out to others, you know, um, that's always helpful in any kind of uh, situation. You know, it's like when when people uh, are trying to move out of grief when they are when they do something for someone else that mm -hmm. helps them as well. Um, so you know, there's there's a lot of um, a lot of different things that, and just self-care. I mean, good self-care, oftentimes when people are in grief, that goes by the wayside. So, you know, it's a basic, um, basic sort of things, but sometimes we lose, we lose sight. And, and I think the other thing too, it's important to move past the point of defining yourself as a motherless daughter, you know, embracing that, recognizing it was a, a big loss, a traumatic time, um, and certainly grieving as long as you need to grieve. But I have encountered many women who for years and years and years, their, you know, their whole life, that's that they define themselves mm. as a person of loss, you know. It beca they become kind of stuck there exactly. as opposed to kind of then, being able to you know, get to the other side and say, you know, what can I, you know, just like you did, it's like you, you're making lemonade out of melons, out of, out of melons, out of lemons, right? You're, you're kind of saying, okay, what, what can I, how can I harness this loss to help others? And um, so, you know, whether it's that another, someone else in your life has lost their mother and now you can empathize and you can be there for them, um, but it sounds like there's also some great support groups, um, you know, out there through local organizations and 
I'm, you know, there's probably some national ones. I don't know. It's certainly Facebook groups that, uh, that can support you as well. The only, the only caveat to that, and I noticed because like I said, I'm on, on a lot of groups, uh, Facebook groups in particular, and there's a lot of ain't it awful scenarios like, oh, oh, right. this, and then somebody like, yeah, and then they do their, they, they up the ain't it awful, but I, but right. my ain't awful is worse than your ain't it awful. And right. it goes on and on and on. So I, I would guard against that. I would, yeah. you know, because that. But there's some groups that are more positive about like, how can we make the most in this time of grief or how can we yeah. heal? Or is it just, you know, it's just, there's people in all these groups that just oh, kind of want to yes. see, like, sit in the muck kind of thing. Exactly. So, yeah. so, you know, you just have to kind of guard against that. Yeah, yeah I bet. Wow. Um, and I wonder how, if your daughters ever had a real sense of um, how much loss had been experienced in your mm -hmm. family and, you know, yourself, as well as past generations of, of early mother loss, and if they ever had a fear around that as a result or it just wasn't spoken about or like how you dealt in terms of raising them to not be afraid that I'm just going to keep you know and there's going to be another one and I'm probably going to lose my mom because the last three generations have lost you know have died young that's a really good question that no one's ever asked me before no, it really is a good question and and frankly it just never came up you know and as I as they, when they were young and as I was mothering them, um, you know, they of course knew that they're, you know, they never knew this grandma and she died very young, but it was um, not a thing. I mean, you know, I didn't dwell on it. Um, it and they were very close to my dad, their grandpa. Mm. Um, I mean, he lived in a different state, but even though they only saw him a couple times a year, they were very, very close to him. So they could see the kind of parent that I had and the kind of parenting I had. But we're, well, for one thing, we're a family of faith, and I think that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly made an enormous difference in my life and their lives. But there, we're also a family that we're not worriers. <laughs> we, we just, our nature is, we just are not worriers. And we're not, um, we don't project into the future, you know. Right. So I think some of that, like you said, that's just such a great question. I'd have to ask them, actually. I know. But, you know. I want you to ask them. And, I, and I'm, I'm curious to know how they reacted to your, your mission now, what you're, the work you're doing. Do they understand what's driving you and I mean I just I oh, wonder yeah. if they start asking you more questions now to say oh you know I never thought about it this way like it must have been hard for mom or you know yeah no I mean they both read my book I mean I have a son too and and my daughters I mean they're my my oldest daughter just turned 51 my other daughter is 40 about to be 46 um, <clears throat> so no, they think it's wonderful. They love it what I'm doing. They're really proud of me uh, for writing a book and so forth. But it hasn't heightened, I don't think, their awareness that, um, you know, that this was sort of an unusual circumstance, really. Yeah, no, very interesting. Uh, just, no, that's who yeah, I yeah, yeah. They don't have thought too right. much about well, it. Well, that's good. That's very healthy. And they must be very securely attached to you. So that's nice. And they have um, daughters. Uh, one of them has three oh, daughters. Wow. And one yeah. of them has two daughters. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't think that... You know, and as I say, I will ask him, but I, I, we talk, we're very, very honest. Uh, we talk at a deep level. In fact, one of them is a coach, a life coach, wow. and the other is a teacher. But, um, but, you know, I think if they would have been thinking about this, they would have talked about it. For sure. Yeah. No. Well, no, it sounds like you have a very open relationship that you would have welcomed, you know, their, if they had questions or anything else. Um, and certainly but I love right... that you pose that question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what, what are you working on next? What, uh, it sounds like maybe there's something else percolating. Yes. I just finished a new book, actually. It's COVID. So I had lots of time and uh, that was one of the the blessings of COVID for me. And I, I started writing it soon after this book was published. 
And of course, I'm doing promotion on this book all the time. But in the meantime, I wrote um, a historical fiction, and it's really the life of uh, one year in the life of my great grandparents on the other side of the family, my dad's side of the family. And they were Nebraska pioneers. And so I wrote it from my great grandmother's perspective. And she was, she married at not quite 15, mm. uh, came across in a wagon train uh, by herself, met her husband and they lived in a, a sod house for a couple of years. And uh, he was a boot maker for a fort, which is a, a, a live fort today. It's been reconstructed and it's a live fort. So that has just been a real joy. I spent my whole uh, summer and fall and up until just recently, I've spent it on the plains of Nebraska and I'm a Nebraska girl originally. So it was really wonderful. And it's about friendship and cooperation and uh, really, you know, a look at what life was like for women in particular in those times. So that's amazing. I just what a departure, you know, what a what a you know from 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 writing memoir and and nonfiction and interviewing women to now historical fiction. That's uh, you are a woman of many talents, Marshawn. Yeah, it was it was really um, it was fun, and it goes to my developmental editor in two weeks. And then the real work begins, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I hope yeah. to have oh. it. The rewrites and all that too. It's like, I've, I've, I know quite a few authors and that's, uh, yeah, but it's, it's ends up being, um, you know, so helpful obviously to have another Not set of eyes on it. Not yeah. Yes. Thanks yeah, for that. So, yeah, of course. Elizabeth, um, and Elizabeth on the Prairie. Elizabeth on the Prairie. Okay. Was that, was that her name? Your great yeah. grandmother yeah. or great? Yes. On, the, on your dad's side, yeah. Yeah, so, it's about Charles Horn. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, wonderful. Um, well, I am so happy that we had a chance to, to talk today and to hear more about your current book and your new book. Um, um, we really appreciate it. We really appreciate your, your time and expertise and, and uh, all your writing, Marshawn. Uh, don't forget to check out the links we'll be adding. And if you enjoy these videos, please watch for more coming weekly. And until then, be well and stay safe, everybody. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you.